Hi, my name is Roger Lewis and I'm a senior medical scientist at Berry Consultants. Today I'm going to talk about what clinicians should know about adaptive clinical trials. When one designs a clinical trial, there's always substantial uncertainty at the beginning regarding how best to treat subjects in the experimental arm. Uncertainty in the best dose of the drug, the duration of treatment, or exactly what the target population should be. That uncertainty creates uncertainty regarding what the optimal trial design would be. Yet with a traditional approach to clinical trial design, all the key clinical trial parameters that are determined at the beginning of the trial are held constant during the trial execution. Essentially, the trial design you start with is the trial design that you carry through to the end. This leads to increased risk of a negative or a failed trial, even if the treatment is inherently effective. And in fact, perhaps a failed trial, one that fails to give a clearly positive or a negative response, is the worst possible outcome after the investment in a clinical trial. However, once patients are enrolled in a trial and their outcomes start to become known, information is accumulating that reduces uncertainty regarding the optimal treatment approaches. Adaptive clinical trials are designed to take advantage of this accumulating information by allowing modification to the trial parameters in response to accumulating information and during the course of the trial according to predefined rules. By taking advantage of this partial information, this allows us to create a smarter trial and lower the chance of a failed trial. This is a, a cartoon that's taken from JAMA back in 2006 that simply shows that an adaptive trial differs from a traditional trial in that there are multiple paths that can be taken from the beginning of the trial, shown by the oval at the top, to the end of the trial, and it is in fact the data that accumulates within the trial itself that determines which path is taken. So when we talk about an adaptive clinical trial, we mean a trial in which we make planned, well-defined changes in key clinical trial design parameters during trial execution and based on data from that trial itself to achieve goals of validity, scientific efficiency, and safety. By planned, we mean that all the changes that we might make are defined a priori. By well-defined, we mean that the criteria for making those changes are planned. And by key parameters, we're talking about changing big things like the number of treatment arms, the dose that's used, or the timing of interim analyses, not minor inclusion or exclusion criteria, not the sorts of things that would fall under routine amendments. And we want to do this in a way in the, uh, so that we achieve scientific validity and can make reliable statistical inferences regarding the treatment effects observed within the trial. So this diagram shows the basic structure of an adaptive trial. We begin the data collection with an initial set of allocation and sampling rules. An allocation rule determines how the incoming patients are allocated to the various available treatment arms. And the term sampling rules refers to how many patients we enroll before we take a first look at the data. Once we have completed that initial period where we're using these initial rules, sometimes this is called the burn-in period, we analyze the available data knowing full well that those data will be incomplete. Some of the patients, for example, may not have made their last study visit, or in fact, some of those data have not been queried yet and there may be a small rate of errors within those data. We ask ourselves, based on the available information, whether a stopping rule has been met, and if no reason for stopping the trial, for example, because of evidence of harm or overwhelming benefit has been uh, met, then we take the available information and we revise those allocation and sampling rules using whatever is the specific adaptive algorithm for the trial. We then continue that data collection and continue this circular process until one of the pre-specified stopping rules is met. One of the pre-specified stopping rules is always that we have reached the maximum allowable sample size for the trial and the stopping rule may dictate that the trial stops, or it may refer simply to stopping a phase or stage of the trial, for example, in a seamless 2-3 design. The process of designing a clinical trial uh, using an adaptive approach has a number of characteristics that distinguish it from the design process for a traditional design. Because one has to consider the kinds of changes that might be made, we often attain greater clarity of goals for the trial. For example, we need to determine whether we're trying to simply show proof of concept, meaning that there is some treatment effect, or we're trying to identify the dose of a drug uh, during a phase two trial that we're gonna carry forward into phase three, versus trying to confirm a benefit that has been preliminary shown in learned phase trials. 
A statistically significant p-value is never the goal of an adaptive trial because it is so easy to generate a trial design that yields a statistically significant p-value but fails to answer the question of what the next stages ought to be in drug or device development. These designs typically take frequent looks at the data because the goal is to make data-driven modifications to the trial, and they are adaptive by design. We are pre-specifying the adaptations and the criteria for those adaptations with specific goals in mind. We are not making post hoc or ad hoc changes to the design. And because these trials are inherently more complex than a traditional trial, we use uh, computer simulation to understand the performance characteristics of the trial and to adjust the characteristics of the trial design to meet our goals for type 1 error control, power, or other operating characteristics. When comparing the characteristics of a traditional approach to clinical trial design to a flexible approach, there's a number of characteristics that generally help us distinguish the two. For example, in a flexible or adaptive approach, there's generally a greater number of interim analyses. We may use a variable randomization ratio as opposed to a fixed one-to-one -one or two-to-one randomization. We generally will have a larger number of experimental arms available to the trial so that we can explore the treatment space with uh, greater um, completion. We, we, we have a plan for using incomplete data that occurs during the um, interim analyses to the best of our ability. And we often use either a Bayesian or frequentist approach, but we have a tendency to use a Bayesian approach to make the best use of partial data. And then as mentioned earlier, we're gonna use computer simulation to understand the error rates of the trial. So why do we do, go to this additional work to do an adaptive and a fundamentally more complex trial design? We do this to avoid getting the wrong answer, to avoid drawing a qualitatively incorrect conclusion, such as concluding that a drug doesn't work when in fact it has clinically important efficacy, or drawing the conclusion that it doesn't work because we didn't apply it in the right patient population. We also want to avoid taking too long to draw the right conclusion, too long in terms of the investment of time, the number of human subjects that are put at risk, or in the spending of scarce resources. When thinking about what are the areas of a trial in which there is an advantage to using adaptive approach, it's very useful cl for clinicians to think about uh, a concept we term anticipated regret. Anticipated regret is a mental exercise where you put yourself in the position of considering what you wish you had done differently if you knew your current approach had led to a failed trial, meaning a trial that failed to definitively answer the question that you are trying to ask. So a substantial fraction of all confirmatory trials fail despite promising learned phase results. Investigators and clinician experts can often anticipate the design decisions they wish they could take over after the trial fails, and those are the areas in which we want to design the adaptive trial to mitigate that risk. Now there is a wide variety of adaptive strategies that we can bring to bear to create a more efficient trial with a greater chance of success. These include frequent interim analyses, longitudinal modeling so we learn about the relationship between early and late endpoints, response adaptive randomization where we change randomization ratios to preferentially randomize future patients to treatment arms that are either the most promising or about which we need the most information, explicit decision rules based on Bayesian predictive probabilities at each interim analysis, so we continue or stop a trial based on the predicted probability of an event in the future, such as the trial ultimately showing benefit. Dose response modeling, so we use the relationship between the treatment responses at different doses to reduce our uncertainty regarding the dose response or enrichment designs where we focus on patient populations based on the data coming into the trial so we enroll the patients most likely to benefit. And all of these approaches, however they're put together in a particular trial, need to be evaluated through extensive numerical simulation so we truly understand the trial's strengths and its weaknesses. So coming back to this picture of the overall adaptive trial, how do we understand what's a good trial and what is a trial that is not yet ready to be implemented or has substantial uh, risks? We do that through a process called trial simulation. In trial simulation, we test drive the clinical trial design thousands of times 
by making assumptions about what the truth is regarding the patient population that's going to be enrolled, the accrual rates, the efficacy and safety profiles of the drugs. So we conduct the trial thousands of times, shown by the stack of uh, pictures, and we look at the average performance. How often does it get the right answer? How often does it get the wrong answer? And we look at the examples of single trials to see if at interim analyses the decisions made by the adaptive algorithm seem ethically, clinically, and scientifically appropriate. It is by inspection of the output of extensive trial simulation that both statisticians and clinicians can understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the trial and understand what its performance should look like during the actual conduct of the trial. Because after all, the goal of this is to kill as few people as possible during the conduct of the trial and at the same time yield scientifically valid, reliable estimates of treatment effects. So in conclusion, not all trials need or should have an adaptive design. But when used appropriately, adaptive designs may improve efficiency and reduce cost, maximize the information obtained from the enrolled patient population, minimize risk to both the subjects and the sponsor. But to achieve this, the design decision should be based on objective performance rather than habit or tradition. And that objective performance uh, is evaluated via simulation. An adaptive design will not save a poorly planned trial or an effect ineffective treatment, but it will help you more efficiently identify those treatments with true, true promise and minimize the efforts expended in testing treatments that are ineffective. Thank you very much.